Hey, everybody, and welcome to episode three of The Stare Down, Show Me the Money. I'm Mallory McCormack, your host, and I'm glad that you're tuning in today to listen. So if you're ready, sit back, relax, grab a drink or two, and listen to The Stare Down. So today's episode is called Show Me the Money, and I think as we start kind of talking through some of these subjects, you'll understand why. So the first one I want to talk about is Johnny Manziel. Um, The new Netflix documentary, Untold, about Johnny Manziel came out this week, and I immediately watched it on Tuesday. Um, I have to admit, he was one of my favorite football players to watch um, in the early uh, 2010s, Uh, so like, think you know, 2012, 2013. Well, yeah, it would honestly be those two years because those were the only two years he played. Um, I loved watching him. I hated playing against him. My Rebels lost some pretty close games to him, but um, he was just really a different style of play, different than, you know, anything the football world had ever seen. And honestly, part of the fun of watching him was kind of the media circus that came with it. Um, So I think the lure of him the persona of this, like, I don't give a, you know what, attitude. I think that's kind of what made him just be who he was. And I think even in his style of play, you saw that he would just run with wild abandonment, it felt like. Um, So part of when I really started paying attention to Johnny Manziel, though, and paying, well, paying really close attention to him was an article that Wright Thompson wrote um, for ESPN, the magazine, I believe, the college football Um, edition for that year. And it ended up being posted on ESPN.com. But it was an article called The Trouble with Johnny. And I remember reading that. And as I read it, I just kind of my hate for him as a person grew more and more. He just seemed like such the total spoiled brat. You know, how dare all these people want to be around him? You know, the same people who had kind of made him famous, all of the fans. And it was just almost like it was a burden. All he wanted to do was go play football. And I understood that to a point. But At the same time, if those fans aren't there watching football, then you don't have a game to go play. So I just felt like he was a very spoiled brat um, type of kid. You know, the article revolved around a day of him playing golf with his dad and he's throwing clubs and smashing them over his knees and all of that kind of stuff. And I just thought, man, he'll just pout at anything. Um, I kind of referred to him a little bit as like the next uh, Tom Cry Brady, as I like to call him. But that whole article too revolved a lot around his dad and kind of his dad's attitude and how he was a lot like his dad. And the narrative was that, you know, of course, why would he sell autographs? You know, his parents bring him autographed or things to autograph each week, but he didn't need to sell them. His parents were just doing it, you know, for their friends and people who asked them to, but definitely the family didn't need money. So there was no way that Johnny was going to be, you know, selling his autograph, making money off of that. And his dad, I kind of feel like his dad perpetuated a little bit of that attitude. And so I just, I don't know, there was just something off about the article and I could never quite, you know, put my finger on it. So fast forward to opener for Texas A&M in the fall of 2013. It was against Rice and Johnny had been suspended for a half a game that was determined um, between the NCAA and Texas A&M. The NCAA had done an investigation and had found no evidence of him selling autographs for money, Um, but they did find that there was an inadvertent violation of NCAA rules by signing certain autographs. So it wasn't that he was signing them for money. It was the fact that he was signing certain things. And it was really weird. I actually went back just to do a little research and read the statement, and it didn't make a whole lot of sense, but it sounded like they had to do something. It wasn't quite right. Something wasn't quite there. And so they just punished him for half a game. Again, half a game for Rice as your opener. I mean, you're supposed to kill him anyway, right? Like you're new in the SEC. You've come in your first year. You have your Heisman winning quarterback starting. I mean, even if he's not starting the first game, y'all are still stacked. So you just come in and and kill him. And they did. But that to me, that game was – 
a little bit of an eye opener for the rest of the season for them. They were definitely not as dominant as they had been the year before. He wasn't as dominant. I felt like there was a little bit of laziness in his play. Um, A little bit more of an attitude, not necessarily like that fiery attitude that he had shown the year before and getting all of his teammates fired up, but just just kind of an attitude of like, I don't really want to be here. I should be off making millions of dollars. I'm just trying to get through this season so that I can declare for the NFL draft and be eligible. And so, um, so we kind of go through the 2013 season with that. And then he goes to the NFL, right? And immediately the stories start coming out. Like he's not watching film. He's not a team player. I mean, granted, he went to the Cleveland Browns. So what can you expect? Um, and I think just that attitude that I had kind of started to see on that field in 2013 at a and I think that was like really coming through. He thought, well, why should I? You know, he gets drafted. And as soon as he gets drafted in New York City, there's a billboard of him that Nike puts up that says, you know, the defense doesn't know where he's going, but for the first time they do. Great line by Nike, not going to lie brilliant brilliant ad but he literally had millions and millions of dollars just handed to him for two years worth of work really and again too let's backtrack a little bit it's not like he hadn't had issues in college as well if you'll remember he was actually arrested for a bar fight before he even started at Texas A&M and it almost derailed him I'm still kind of shocked that someone let him play after that Um, I always kind of got the impression that someone was a little bit of a disciplinarian, um, maybe sometimes a little too tough on players, but obviously he wasn't. So, you know, just little things here and there, obviously underage drinking throughout his entire college career. Oh, and that was the other thing too in the article that Wright Thompson wrote, you know, The Trouble with Johnny. If I did my math correctly, I believe he was only 20 at the time. And, you know, they're talking about him ordering beers and things like that. And again, I'm not ever going to condone anyone's parents if they want to allow their children to drink. That is their decision. I'm not saying I agree with it, but whatever. Like in the state of Mississippi, if you are 18 years old and with your parent, your parent can order a drink for you in a bar, in a restaurant. I believe the same is true in Wisconsin. So there are states like that. So, you know, if that's happening, that's fine. If it's legal and they're following all of the laws, you know, maybe not drinking and driving and those kinds of things. Sure, go for it. But I don't know. Again, my little spidey senses are up and I kind of feel like that maybe wasn't the case. So let's go back to his time in the NFL and, you know, strangling his girlfriend while they're driving, you know, getting in a wreck. Uh, All of these crazy parties, you know, he flew to Vegas one night, the night before a game. Y'all think about that. He is a professional football player who has a game the next morning. The thing, like the only job he has to do is to go play. And instead, he decides he's going to go to Vegas the night before the game. He's going to gamble. He's going to party. He's going to do everything else that he's doing. And then he's going to try and make it back and play the next day. Well, in the Untold series this that dropped on Tuesday... They tell you he missed his flight like he missed every commercial flight. And so he couldn't get back there. And that's when the Browns finally were like, nah, we're done. We've had enough. Like, it's time for you to go. And for me, I think that was kind of when internally I felt like, yep, everything I'd felt about this kid was dead on. Spoiled brat. Always going to have family money there to like be his safety net when everything goes wrong. And you know what? If he's going to piss away an opportunity like that, then let him. Like, just absolutely let him. You also kind of have to remember, too, there's always probably something else going on, right? They're not going to always let you into the mental health side of things. And so I tried to be a little... um forgiving I guess on that because you don't ever know what's going on in someone's life been there done that myself you know people have no idea what anyone's going through at any time but 
you literally have the world handed to you and people have invested so much money in you that I'm pretty sure if you really needed help, they would help you. But you've got to want to help yourself. And I think he didn't. So he kind of fades away. You know, we I stopped following him. And then all of a sudden this untold episode comes up. You know, obviously he's gone to rehab since then. And, and so I was so, like I said, so excited to watch this. Kind of wanted to get the truth. And sure enough, family money was a lie. It was a lie started by his high school best friend who basically ended up being his everyday assistant, who when he actually went to the NFL, um, they told him that there was not going to be an everyday assistant role. And Johnny even said in the Untold documentary, he hasn't spoken to him since that day. I think that probably says a lot. Um, He used him for that purpose, but it was this friend's idea that that's what needed to be said. Like, why would he need to sell autographs? He comes from family money. And y'all, they came up with this whole scheme where Johnny would literally hand his grandfather the thousands upon thousands of dollars of cash that he made from signing autographs. So NCAA, maybe get some better investigators if that's how you're going to dig into it because they obviously miss something. But he would hand his grandfather all of this money and his grandfather would deposit it and then write him a check to make it look like it was family money. Y'all, that just, it's simple, but, and it fooled the NCAA, but it was just like, holy crap. His mom and dad were in on it, obviously, as per the article that Thompson, or or that Wright Thompson wrote. You know, his dad was like, Everybody thinks, you know, that he has to do this, but no, we come from money. Like, we don't have to do this. Well, obviously his dad knew. His parents kept an entire garage full of stuff for him to sign and sell. (laughs) So he was doing exactly what the NCAA thought he was doing. And like I said, his parents were in on it. And what's so crazy is, is watching the Untold documentary, I got the feeling that his parents were kind of pissed more so his dad than his mom, but his, his, they were just pissed that a and wasn't doing more to protect him. And I'm like, really? You're the parents here. You're the adults. You're the ones that have raised him. You're the ones that are supposed to help provide this, you know, ideal situation for him. Help him work through these things. You're supposed to be the one to be the good example. And they weren't even doing it because they were in on it. You know, his dad, I think the the one quote that I wrote out of that article is his dad even said about the supposed family money, it's not Garth Brooks money, but it's a lot of money. Well, yeah, it's money. It's hundreds of thousands of dollars that your kid is getting for hopping on a plane to Miami for one night, signing a bunch of stuff, partying his ass off, hopping back on a plane and going back to college. Like the kid even got to go to online only classes. And this is 2012, 2013. We all know full online classes didn't happen until about seven years later. So he was getting every accommodation possible to help rein in this Johnny football persona that had been built up. And it was crazy. There were so many other signs too, like his dad was working at a car dealership that was hours away and he would work like extended hours and he would only come home on the weekend. Well, come on y'all. Like, I don't know many people who have, you know, not Garth Brooks money, but a lot of money who work that hard. I just don't. Maybe y'all do. If you do, let me know. Um, I'd love to talk to him and find out, like, why. Is it just because they don't want to be bored? I mean, I could maybe get that. But, again, how the NCAA turned an eye, a blind eye to this is just still baffling, even after all of these years. And, ultimately, kind of what... I feel like both the Wright Thompson article and the untold documentary got to was that both Johnny and his family felt that it was absolutely insane that all of these other people were making money off of his name, except him. And is that fair? Hell no. You know, they even said in the documentary that Adidas at one point sold out of the maroon number two Texas A&M jerseys like there were none left not even the maroon jerseys that they could print more number twos on like they ran out of stock completely you know Texas A&M ended up with 
some of the largest donations in school history. They were able to expand their football stadium. I mean, they show the document or in the documentary, they show the footage of them imploding the stadium and rebuilding it. And I'm sure as he's watching this happen, he knows that it's him winning the Heisman. It's all of the money that's coming in from that. That's helping pay for that. But yet he's not getting any of it. So I, I get that sentiment, right? And I think, you know, kind of ultimately what we see that lead to is what we now know as the NIL. So, you know, Johnny Manziel, yeah, great example as to why the NIL probably came about probably the biggest example and the best example as to why it was needed. You know, I understand schools are going to make money off of players, but, you know, these kids, a lot of them don't come from anything. And so being able to make money off of their own name, image, or likeness. Like, it was a long time coming. So, a couple of other things that kind of happened between that 2012 to 2020 time frame. Um, you know, the NIL actually went into effect July 1st of 2021. But, you know, in that, in that eight years, almost nine years, between Johnny Manziel and when the NIL went into effect, there were two big NCAA um, violations that happened with two SEC schools. And sorry to all of my fellow rebels, but I got to bring it up. One of them was ours. Um, You know, Ole Miss, we got pinged with lack of institutional control because of an unconstrained culture of booster involvement in football recruiting. Direct quote. You know, a couple of things that were mentioned then were that, you know, Laramie Tunsil, his ex-stepdad apparently took money for his play. Um, Laramie also apparently kept a car for too long. Um, and I shouldn't probably say apparently on the keeping the car too long because um, it, that was proven. He did that. You know, and so there were all of these things that they could prove specifically around Laramie Tunsil. Um, there was even a player who slept on none, un- none other than Lane Kiffin's brother's Chris's couch for a couple of nights because he got kicked out of his apartment, had nowhere to go. We got dinged for that. Um, as you kind of get into more of the Hugh Freeze era, um, supposedly we paid Leo Lewis a thousand or $11,000 to come play at Ole Miss. And to me, this is kind of where the NCAA really screwed up and was another big fracture in their structure that would eventually lead to the NIL and some other things we see today. So the NCAA had previously never given blanket immunity to players from other schools to rat out another school. And in the meantime, rat out their current school and their current school not get in trouble. Well, don't worry. The NCAA did it in this case. You know, they let Leo Lewis go in there and testify that, yep, $11,000 was given to him from Ole Miss boosters. But don't worry, y'all. He went to play for State, who only gave him 10000 I don't know. You know, maybe I am naive, but... Uh, if somebody's giving me 11,000 or somebody's giving me 10,000 to play, I'm probably going to go with the 11,000. That's just simple math. Last time I checked, 11 is more than 10. Um, but you know what? Whatever. So he, but he readily admitted on record that state gave him $10,000. And do you know what happened in Mississippi State? Nothing. Now, I will caveat that with there were a lot of other things that had happened at Ole Miss that we got in trouble for within this sweeping investigation some academic fraud from the previous head coach's uh tenure houston nut looking at you but that's okay i get it no worries you do what you got to do i guess um and the past is the past but what ended up happening to Ole Miss at that point our penalty from the years long investigation and y'all when i say years i mean years long investigation We had to vacate 33 wins between 2010 and 2016. We got a two-year postseason ban for 2017 and 2018. Three years of probation through 2020, as well as scholarship reductions and recruiting restrictions. Overall, 13 scholarships were reduced. And recruiting restrictions, I believe it was that unofficial visits per player could only be one per year. 
And also there was like a six week, five or six week period where our coaches could not have any on campus recruits. Um, There may have been a little bit more to it, but I believe that's what it was. So you have that. Well, right as the 2017 story or seasons about to hit Ole Miss as another um, story hit. And that's that Hugh Freeze had to resign. So I'll probably end up having to do a whole episode on this just as some crazy memories and what in the world happened to get Ole Miss football to where we currently are. But this is one of those things, you know, Hugh Freeze resigned and yes, he was texting escort services on his state issued cell phone. And so they got him with the morality clause in his contract. And I think, you know, the university was probably looking for a way to get rid of him because he kind of brought a lot of the NCAA investigation on us. We beat Bama two years in a row. We were having unprecedented success and we're just this tiny little school in Mississippi. Well, obviously we have to be paying kids, right? There's no way that our tiny little school can go up against Nick Saban and the Auburns of the world and do what we did and succeed like that and recruit these kids and recruit the number one player in his class, Robert Kim Dietschy. Um, But we did. And when Hugh Freeze tweeted out, hey, if you have any violations, please email us at compliance at olemiss.edu, all hell broke loose. So we invited it, right? Like, maybe maybe don't snub your nose at them uh, when you kind of already know they want to take you down anyway. Uh, like I said, that's totally a whole other conversation for another day. Um, So yeah, so that was probably one of the biggest things that happened during that time. But then there was another one that just recently had the sanctions come down, and that was Tennessee. And Tennessee's were insane, in my mind. It was during Jeremy Pruitt's tenure, his three years there. Um, He was there from 2018 to 2020. According to the NCAA investigation, there were over 200 violations Y'all listen to that. Over 200 violations. And we're not talking like little onesie twosies here and there. If you have 200 violations during a three-year period, that is part of your culture. I mean, just insanity. So NCAA recently comes out. Their penalty is pay $8 million, vacate wins and four staffers including Pruitt were given show cause orders which basically means that they can't work in certain capacities in college sports for a certain amount of time Um, the same thing actually did happen with some Ole Miss staffers as well in fact Hugh Freeze got a show cause and I believe Nick Saban wanted to hire him on as an analyst and I think Greg Sankey said no let's maybe not do that so Uh, Thanks, Greg Sankey, for stepping up. Maybe not thanks for letting Mississippi State let Leo Lewis go route on us, but, you know, whatever. Turnabout's fair play, so I think think Ole Miss is okay. I'm happy with where we're at. And, again, all of this kind of led to us getting there. So, But, you know, back to the original point. The NCAA and Mark Emmert, ugh, I can't stand that guy, y'all. I'm so happy he is not the head of the NCAA anymore. He is gross. I believe at one point he said that as long as he was president of the NCAA, students would not get paid. Well, guess what? Never say never, you little turd, because while you were still there, like I said, as of July 1st, 2021, the NIL went into effect. And I think The Johnny Manziel situation, the Ole Miss situation, the Tennessee situation, and I'm sure countless others out there that I would never have enough time to research all of them for a weekly podcast. Um, But there are so many out there that these kids had a point. This is not football of the 70s, 80s, even the 90s. You know, There are so many millions and millions and millions of dollars being made off of these kids and their name, their image, and their likeness. Okay, so for example, I'll go back to another another Ole Miss player that I love, Eli Manning. When Eli was there in the early 2000s, you better believe everybody had a number 10 jersey. Now, did it say Manning on the back? No. So, okay. 
Eli was wearing number 10. Who else were we buying the jersey to support? We wanted to support Eli. We loved Eli. None of that money ever went to him. And yes, he got a full scholarship. And I understand that. And all of these football players get full scholarships. And they do get a little bit of a stipend for housing and food. But it's not the same. They're expected to basically work two full-time jobs. They have to go to school and keep their grades up. And for some of them, that is a lot harder. You know, school is not for everybody. And then they have to go to practice. And yes, there are restrictions on practice, but come on, y'all. Like, if you want to stay at the top of your game, you are doing everything and then some of your coaches ask of you. So, when do they have time to go be college students? When do they have time for anything like that? And Every single one of us in our lives gives up something for something else. So, you know, if I leave my current job to go make 20000 more a year, I'm probably going to work maybe more than 40 hours a week. I'm probably going to let them text me on the weekends and respond or maybe go travel and, you know, leave on a Sunday night and come back late Friday, definitely over the 40 hours thing. I'm definitely going to be giving more of myself because that's a trade off. Like they can have a little bit more of my time and I'm going to get a little bit more money. And so I think that's really all that these student athletes really wanted. They wanted to be able to get some of that money back for their time. And like I said, every single one of us that has a job, that's exactly what we're doing. So I'm all for it. I love the NIL. Is it perfect? Hell no. Could it be fixed? I'm sure. Now, is Tommy Tuberville going to be the one to fix it with his horrible legislation that he's presented? Nope. Sorry, Tommy. You can't let a kid be forced into staying at their original school for three years and then leave and pay a penalty for it. I don't know many people whose jobs, they are forced to sign a three-year contract and they're not allowed to leave within three years if the management changes, if other things change. Well, it's college football. Coaches leave every year. You know, and I've heard the argument my whole life too. A kid should commit to the school, not the coaching staff. Come on, y'all. Do you commit to your job? Do you say yes to a job offer because you just absolutely love the boss and don't really care about the company and the benefits they offer or anything like that. Sometimes, yeah. Yeah, you absolutely do. You like those people. Sometimes working with good people and people that you click with is more important than going to a job where you know you are going to be absolutely miserable day in and day out. It's the same thing with choosing a college. They're going to pick the coaches that get them and that honestly probably have a scheme that's going to fit their style of play, that they can go shine in. And I'm not just saying this about college football. I'm saying this about every college sport out there. I am pretty sure that Coach Yo would tell you she would rather have a girl who no one knows about, but that's going to come in and work and fit into her style of play that she runs her program within instead of having a McDonald's All-American. Now, granted, she has a McDonald's All-American currently, but would she take four or five girls who fit that style that she wants us to play with over one McDonald's All-American who eh, may fit into it, may not, but man, we want the flashy? Yeah, she would absolutely take those four or five. So again, not just all of college football, but every college sport out there. It's the same, no matter where you go. And let's also be completely honest. I'm going to call out a little bit of the NCAA's hypocrisy here. Come on, NCAA. Yes, Ole Miss may have paid $11,000 to Leo Lewis. But you mean to tell me that players at Bama, Ohio State, Notre Dame, USC, Oregon, Georgia, everywhere else, Heck, even the little D2 school I went to for undergrad, money's exchanging hands at all of those places. Cars are being given to players. Like, this was happening everywhere. So, I mean, yeah, Ole Miss just got caught. I get it. And now the NIL is honestly kind of leveling the playing field a little bit. Like, I kind of love it. Um, It's fun. It's going to be 
a lot more fun. I have always equated the transfer portal um, specifically to free agency in the NFL. And I think that's part of why Lane Kiffin has been so successful at Ole Miss is because he gets it. He was an NFL head coach at one point. Now, granted, he was young and dumb, but he understood how to play free agency. So he's done that. Well, then when it came time to not only have that, but what do you do in free agency in the NFL? You're going to go nine times out of 10 where the money is. So when he, when the rumors were swirling last season that he was going to leave us for Auburn, what'd we do as a fan base? Man, we increased our NIL. We did like we almost $10 million from poor little Mississippi, right? We're now finally leveling that playing field and, I don't know why Emirate never saw that, but he didn't. And like I said, I'm glad he's not over the NCAA anymore. I think this is his mess. I think all of this is actually his mess. And that's actually going to lead to my next point that I'll get to right after this break. Okay, so hopefully you went and got a drink refill during the break. Um, I know I can be long-winded, but hang with me. I promise you all of these things are going to make a connection. What I think has now finally happened is probably the worst-case scenario. NIL is driving college football specifically to become a little bit of a pro type of league. Um, the money, like I said, Ole Miss has $10 million in NIL. Now, granted, that gets spread across all sports, but the majority of it's probably going to go towards football because they are the biggest money maker. Like, no one can deny that it is. So, it makes sense, right? But what's happening now, though, is these schools realize there's money that's going to be directed to the NIL, so they need to have better TV packages, and they need to find other sources of income that are being taken because their donations are going to be taken away and put towards NIL, but they've still got to continue to upgrade facilities. They've still got to do everything to be the best and be state of the art. So what do we end up with? We end up with the hot topic of the day, conference realignment. I don't blame Florida State for saying what they said. I'd probably want to leave the ACC right now too if I were them. I think that, you know, the Pac-12, bless their sweet little hearts, they're about to be the Pac-4. Ugh, yikes. I'm not surprised, though. Everything the NCAA has done up to this point by making sure that players never got paid and that some schools were scrutinized harder than others – it just was never going to work. It was always going to be this type of snowball effect. And you can't make it so stringent that no one can follow it because you do end up in these situations. So now we do have conference realignment. You know, Texas and Oklahoma are coming into the SEC. I understand it. Do I like it? No, I still don't really like the fact that Texas A&M and Missouri are part of the SEC, but it is what it is. I'm not in charge. I don't have a say. So I'll just live with it. And I'll just hope that my rebels can stay relevant. But money is the name of the game. And Florida State and Clemson, if they stay in the ACC, I don't think it'll be for long. I think that if they stay, they will only stay through 2024. And in 2025, they will be somewhere else. My current prediction is that both could leave for the SEC. I think Clemson absolutely leaves for the SEC. Um, Florida State, I could see them going either SEC or Big Ten, but I'd kind of be okay if they came to the SEC. I think it would be great to have another team in the state of Florida. I don't necessarily want Miami, but I'd be great with Florida State. Um, I think there have been some good rivalries over the years with that. I think it would be fun if somehow they do come into the SEC and Jimbo can somehow hang on to his job at Texas A&M. I would love to see them play each other. I would love to see Florida State get a little bit of revenge on him. 
Um, shout out to my neighbor, JJ. You heard it here first. I will cheer for Florida State anytime y'all play Texas A&M because I want Jimbo to lose. But you're starting to see these schools jump to conferences even though that don't make sense. Obviously, Clemson and Florida State going to the SEC, that makes sense, right? Geographically, it makes perfect sense. But now you have, which thankfully the ACC presidents on Wednesday night were smart enough and it stalled out, but they were literally talking about bringing in Cal and Stanford to the ACC. That's the Atlantic Coast Conference for those of you that don't know. Tell me where California is, because last time I checked, it's not on the Atlantic coast. It's on the Pacific. So, all right, cool. Let's give a couple of examples here. Maybe Cal and Stanford can allow their football players to leave on a Wednesday, on a plane, fly across country, get a couple of days to get acclimated to the time zone and all of that. Um, Play one game hop back on a flight on Sunday and go home and reacclimate for a day or two. Maybe Florida State can do the same. I don't know. But what happens when your baseball team starts playing conference play? And so the Cal baseball team has to hop on a plane, fly to Florida State for, I'll even give them a Friday through Sunday series. I won't even make it weird and do a Thursday through Saturday. I'll give them the full Friday through Sunday, the normal weekend series in college baseball. Okay, well, they don't have a couple of days to hop on a plane and go earlier. Most teams have midweek games. So you've got that. Baseball, it's not just one game. It's a three-game series. So they're going to play on Sunday. They're going to hop back on a plane Sunday night, and then they're going to fly back to Cal. They're going to then have another midweek game. So they're only going to have, like, one day in between everything. Y'all, that's not possible That's just not possible. Oh, and by the way, let's also remember, as the NCAA wants everybody to remember, these are student athletes because they're supposed to be students first. When are they going to study? And yeah, you can argue, well, they can study on the plane. Okay, great. Then is the NCAA going to allow the programs to pay for those students to get Wi-Fi connection during the flight? Is that going to be part of their travel stipend? Because it should be. It's an essential part of them being able to do schoolwork. I don't know. Like, these are all things that are just not being answered. And, you know, this week you saw Eli Drinkwitz, you saw Lane Kiffin, and you saw Nick Saban, all three come out and say, look, conference realignment is not where we need to be heading It's going to do away with rivalries. It's going to prevent fans from being able to see the games the way that we're used to being able to see them. It's going to prevent parents from being able to see their kids play a sport that they probably played their whole lives and that their parents probably spent tons of money on and time getting them from a tournament or a lesson or home from practice to, you know, a weight room session to a game to tryouts for somewhere you know their parents have put in all of this and so a lot of these students college is the last hoorah for them and so why not let their parents have the ease and ability to go watch them play close by because a lot of the conferences the way they have been set up until all this chaos started was geographically well now Like I said, California, Florida, not really in the same geographic region. Um, And again, like I said, I understand there are planes. You can always make an argument. You can always make a counter argument. But in this case, it's stupid. And these kids' mental health, you put pressure like that on someone, I don't know that it's healthy for them mentally. I'm obviously not a licensed psychiatrist or psychologist or therapist, but as someone who has been to a therapist multiple times in my life, I feel like when I have been at my most stressed out was when I was traveling a lot for work and then had things to do at home and the dogs to take care of. And I was traveling to see family and all of these things I wanted to do. And y'all, it's just not possible to, to juggle every single thing. So I think that these kids are going to be the ones that are screwed over. Um, I think maybe the football players less than 
the women's basketball team, then the softball team, then the baseball team, then the golf team even. You know, I just don't think this is good for college sports as a whole. I think we are going to end up with something that looks a lot like what the NFL has currently. You're going to end up with two conferences and you know, divisions within each conference. Um, you know, currently the NFL has two conferences and four divisions in each. I don't know that college has the ability to go to something that small, but say you end up with four conferences and then divisions within each. You're going to end up seeing something like that. We're going to look very pro-esque in college sports before it's all over and done with. So, you know what? Like I said, Mark Emmert, thank you. Your uh, true lack of leadership and your inability to address the environment that you were working within has led to this complete and utter shit show. So round of applause to you wherever you are. I hope you're enjoying retirement while these kids continually be stressed out and will continually be thought of as money makers only instead of an actual human being within a jersey. That jersey does not make them. They are humans. And so I just, you know what? I just, I got to give it to you. You screwed it up even more than I thought was absolutely possible. And you left the NCAA in such a horrible state of affairs. I don't, I don't know how college sports recovers from it. Um, I honestly believe that in three or four years, if I'm still here doing this, uh, I will be talking about how different the landscape is. And one of my favorite quotes from a movie ever is attitude reflects leadership. Um, thank you. Remember the Titans, Julius, shout out to you for that one. But I think that the lack of leadership that college sports has had from the NCAA standpoint, um, it's, it's finally catching up to us and it's not going to be good. That being said, I will still support in any way I can. I will still show these students that I understand they are humans and human beings first. They have feelings and they are more than just money for my university. So cheers to all of you student athletes out there. I wish nothing but success for all of you. And uh, just remember your mental health is worth way, way more um, than most people want to admit. So keep that in mind. All right, I'm going to hop off of the college football and NCAA soapbox for now. Um, we talked a lot with Jamie on episode two about the U.S. Women's National Team. And man, I was so hoping that the book, The National Team, was going to have to be re-edited to include a third World Cup victory in a row. But alas, it, it didn't happen. Um, it was absolutely disappointing. I don't know that there's anyone that will tell you it's disappointing. So to all of the negative naysayers out there, the ones who were hoping that this team lost, um, shame on you. That would be like me cheering for you to go into your job and lose every day or you to do something stupid. Like, that's just not cool, guys. Like, what, what does it matter? Like, if you don't want to cheer for him, just don't cheer for him. But come on. We're supposed to be America, right? We're supposed to be the ones who, like, cheer for each other, like, because we're the best. Yeah, okay. Hypocrisy is alive and well, y'all. Just going to throw that one out there. But I want to take a step back, and I want to put a little perspective on, even though they didn't win, they still made it to the round of, of 16. So the sweet 16. We all know that term, right? So let's put this into perspective. The round of 16 was the worst that they have ever placed in any Women's World Cup. Any. And they've played in all of them, y'all. They've played in every single one of them. So let's compare that to the men. Well, the men didn't even qualify for the 2018 tournament. So I'm pretty sure the women are still way ahead of the men. Now that they both have equal pay and they're going to split the prize money that each one made. Um, and shout out to the men. I'm going to give them their props. They made it to the round of 16 in the 2022 Men's World Cup. That was so unexpected. It was great. I'm glad. I really hope that this means that U.S. men's soccer is on the rise. Um, I hope it's a really good thing for them. So basically, both teams make it to the same level. <laughs> this is where it gets fun, y'all. The men 
got $13 million for making it to the round of 16. The women got $1,870,000 for making it to the same level. So the men got almost six times more than the women? What? Yeah, make that math make sense. Like, and if you can, please let me know. Here's where it gets even worse. No matter who wins the Women's World Cup this year, that team will get $4,290,000, whereas the men's teams from the 2022 World Cup that didn't even make it out of group play each got $9 million. So that means you had 16 teams in the 2022 Men's World Cup make more than double for not even, for just making it to the World Cup. They made more than double than the winner of the Women's World Cup is going to make. Again, make it make sense. Pay disparity? I'm pretty sure this is the actual definition of it. So, with that being said, to the U.S. Women's National Team, thank you for going for it, for playing, for getting America excited for soccer again. Um, You got me into it. I'll be honest, I will now watch the Men's World Cup and the Olympics a little bit closer and be cheering for the Americans every single time like I always do. And I appreciate that. So thanks for y'all for, uh, for at least making a new fan out of me. But thanks for going out there for fighting for pay equality like you have and for still making it to the round of 16. We're still relevant no matter what anybody says. All right. So I got one last topic. And I'm going to give y'all a little bit of a break because I'm pretty sure if you didn't get a refill of your drink, during that last break, you're going to want one now. So stay tuned and we'll wrap everything up. All right. So hope you got that refill. Hope it's good because we're going to talk about one of my favorite stories. And boy, is this one going to be a whole lot to uncover. This isn't going to be the last time you hear about this from me. I'm going to watch this and we're going to keep talking about it. It was decided today, Thursday, August 10th, 2023, by the Mississippi Supreme Court that Brett Favre will not be removed as a defendant in a civil lawsuit that is seeking to recover $77 million of misspent welfare money. So, this story has been so utterly disgusting to watch. It ties back to me to what I think college athletes were fighting for in trying to get the NIL pushed. Why continue to allow the rich to get richer And ignore the poor. Like, forget even making them poorer than they are. We're just going to act like they don't even exist. And we're going to take all of the gold. And we're going to make sure that we get rich and richer and richer. And there's going to be such a big disparity between the two that it's going to get to a point to where you just can act like they don't even exist anymore. So, if you haven't followed along with this story... I highly suggest that you go to Mississippi Today. It is a um, news source in Mississippi. It is phenomenal. They do incredible journalism there. There is a reporter by the name of Anna Wolf, and she actually, through Freedom of Information Act request, uncovered this scandal, basically, um, where it is alleged that They took money that was set aside for specific welfare programs for the state of Mississippi. And Brett Favre was able to allegedly 
get five million of it to put towards a new volleyball facility at Southern Miss, his alma mater. Let's also throw in there that his daughter was a player, a volleyball player at the time. Um, he also got one point one million dollars for speaking engagements that allegedly he didn't actually do, and a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, he's trying to play ignorant. He's trying to play like he has no idea what he was doing, that he didn't understand. And Anna's reporting and the text messages and emails that she was able to get access to through her persistent digging and knowing that that little gut feeling of something wasn't right here, she listened to it. And as she dug and dug and dug, you can see things change. These people, and this is my opinion, because none of them have been, uh, oh, at least not Brett Favre. Brett Favre has not been charged criminal, criminally in this. There are others who have been, um, but Brett Favre has not been charged criminally. However, in my mind, he is absolutely guilty of this. And playing the, oh, I didn't know what I was doing, oh, I didn't know any better card is crap. Look, Brett, just because you're from Mississippi and you may not want to think as hard as others or you may want to play up the whole, oh, I'm just a country boy from Mississippi and I don't know any better. Actually, let me let me redo that. I said it wrong. I'm just a country boy from Mississippi. I don't know any better. I don't know how to do math and see and da 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 da. I didn't realize that when someone gave you one point one million dollars for a speaking engagement that that meant you actually needed to go and speak. Come on, dude. We're not dumb. Even if we were born in the state of Mississippi, we are not that dumb. You took advantage of your home state. You took advantage of those who were so much less fortunate than you that you should be on your knees every day thanking the good Lord that you don't have to ever know what their struggles are like. And you should be ashamed that you used your star power to become richer and to use your name for your benefit. I'm pretty sure karma is a bitch and one of these days it's going to bite you and it's going to bite you real hard and she's going to come at you with a vengeance because anyone who will do that and turn their eye on their fellow human being and fellow Mississippian in this case is lower than low. So to wrap this whole thing up, this whole tirade that I just went on, Thank you, Mississippi Supreme Court, for holding him accountable and for allowing him to continue to be held accountable as this lawsuit makes its way through the court system. Thank you, Anna Wolf, for being an utter wolf in this case. Thank you for continuing to dig and to fight. You know, I always want to think the best of the sports heroes that come out of my home state. We all do, right? Like, you don't ever want to think anything ill of people. But guys, there are just people out there that are just, they're just not good people. And I think Brett Favre is probably one of them. That says nothing about his ability to play football, right? Like, I think he was a phenomenal football player. But I just, I just don't understand how he can do this. So, again, like I said, shout out to Anna Wolf. She led the charge on this, and she won a Pulitzer Prize for her coverage of this, which she absolutely deserved. Um, but it's just, it's disgusting. And so I'm actually really glad that this decision happened um, before I was going to record this, because to me, it just wrapped up why I wanted to do this episode. Title of it's Show Me the Money. Well, that's all anybody cares about, right? Show me the money. Where's the money? How can I get more money? How can I get this? I want to be better. Me, me, me. Money, money, money. That's all anybody cares about. But y'all, there's so much more to life than that. And making sure that people have opportunities to go and live and get an education, let these athletes go have these opportunities to get these educations, to go help become better 
than the generation before them, to do better than the generation before them. Those are the kinds of things we should be showing them. Athletic ability is not always promised. Um, You can go look at a guy by the name of K.D. Hill. K.D. Hill played football for Ole Miss, and last year was the Chucky Mullins Courage Award winner. So he got to wear Chucky's number 38. And he was, you know, working out for XFL teams, those kinds of things. I believe he had just signed a contract with an XFL team. And he was in a car crash, and he laid there for three hours. They were able to get him out and unfortunately had to amputate one of his legs below the knee. Guess what? That athletic ability to use both of his legs to play football was gone in an instant. But you know what no one will ever take away from him? His education, his mind, his experiences that have helped him get through difficult times to get him through this difficult time. And that's what we should be paying more attention to instead of these schools getting, you know, just stupid, crazy locker rooms. Don't get me wrong. You have to, right? To stay relevant, you have to. But let's make sure that we're taking care of those people who are putting on those uniforms to represent that school on the field. Let's make sure they're taken care of before we take care of anybody else. Let's make sure that that student athlete that we're taking care of our students. Our universities need to take care of our students. And hey, if we're professional athletes, let's make sure that we are doing what we can with the star power and the God-given talent that we've been given to help our fellow man, to make it better for everybody. Because what what does it hurt if I do something to help someone that's deemed less fortunate than me? What does that do to me? Nothing, absolutely nothing. So everything's about money. It always has been. It always will be. I'm not that naive, guys. I know you're probably sitting there shaking your head going, God, this girl is just completely delusional. But I promise you I'm not. Um, So yeah, that's just my two cents. Or if you've sat here for the full hour, however much you make at your job in an hour, that's that's what this is worth. Um, But in case you didn't notice... This was the first episode where I didn't have a guest. So I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you will leave me feedback. Um, You can always, always, always send me ideas to the email, uh, thestaredownpod at gmail.com. You can find me on Instagram at thestaredown underscore podcast. You can find me on Twitter because I refuse to call it X. So you can find me on Twitter at The Stare Down Pod. You can also find me on Facebook at The Stare Down Podcast. It has its own page now. Um, let me know. What do you want to hear? What topics do you want to hear me talk about? What guests do you want to hear? Do you want to hear more football? Do you want to hear more basketball? I'm all for it. I want to provide you a space to come and listen to things that you deem are relevant and interesting. So like I said, leave me some feedback. You can always go to the alabamatake.com as well. Leave feedback there on the blog posts that I always put up that go um, in conjunction with each episode. Please also remember that any anything that I have said today uh, that was an opinion is strictly my own opinion. It is not indicative of the opinions of the Alabama Take family. Um, and so don't hold it against them if I said something that you maybe didn't like. Uh, hold it against me and... Even then, like, it's really okay. I'll, I'll get through it if you didn't like it. But I do hope you like it. I hope you enjoyed my perspective. Um, I hope that now we can all just sit back, relax, enjoy a drink or two, and uh, look forward to the next stare down. I'll see y'all next Friday. Um, we're going weekly now, so tune in and see what fun I have for you then. Have a good one. Bye, y'all.